Thank you so much, uh, Eyal, for a very interesting talk. And thank you all for three very interesting presentations. Um, I'm going to jump straight into it because we don't have so yeah. much time. So um, I actually want to pick up on something uh, that both uh, Teddy and Eyal have been talking about. Um, Teddy mentioned this kind of idea of making things visible. And Eyal was talking about things speaking to one another. And I was wondering if you could maybe both uh, um, comment on this idea of the architect as a witness in, in different contexts, but this idea of the architect as witness. Mm. Well, Eyal, do you want to begin? or um, I have called in my previous uh, work uh, architecture, um, political plastic, right? Yes. Well, it means, I mean, Boyce has this, uh, Joseph Boyce has this, he said, sculpture is a social plastic, no? And architecture is a political plastic in a sense that it is actually material that exists within a force field, uh, political, economical, in my case, military and juridical force field that shapes it. And therefore, you can look at form and harvest from form the forces that shaped it, right? Now, this is never a transparent process, and it's a very complicated and imperfect process. So the act of witnessing through architecture is an act of reconstructing those processes that are saturated in form. But in what I would um, very much insist on when discussing forensics or testimony, etc. Witnessing is not simply speaking for. There is technologies, techniques, spaces that need to be constructed for it. There's a whole architecture that scaffolds it, and that is the forum. Now, we can speak about the forum as a real space that you build, and it's round, and it looks like an arena, or a court, or a parliament, or whatever. Or a forum can be an ad hoc kind of gathering around a particular act of testimony, or it could be networked through electronic media, right? Yeah. But there is a relation in, as architects, we must think about the relationship between the thing that speak, that translated through architecture, and the construction, the architectural sometimes, construction of forums, yeah. but as alternative of, political yeah. spaces. Sorry. But, but part of it also is that in this case, the evidence, the thing itself also becomes a witness, a kind of spokesperson. And in so doing, I think, suggests the construction of a very different political language that at times, in my case, needs to be moved from the kind of specialist voice to the enabling of the voice, in this case, let's say, loosely speaking, of a community, uh, of a, a condition very much is inscribed in a, in a kind of particular uh, dynamic of conflict. In this case, the example I couldn't really talk to uh, about too much, it was the Korea example, is that the models became the mechanism to produce a new political language to defend the neighborhood through the activists, because the activists were, as usual, just bitching about the problems as they came to the municipality to protest, but there was not enough intelligence to really convey why it was tragic that the demolition of the neighborhood was in fact diminishing the energies that would allow a very different model of economy of housing. So in other words, the models became ways of visualizing the kind of performance of those spaces and enabling a different language. And so in that sense, it's not that the architect becomes a witness, but the facilitator of the visualization yeah. of the performance of those conditions across many registers, of course. So um, do you think it would be fair to say that actually in order to practice the way that you all practice, you actually have to invent your own tools or your own language in order to do this? Would be fair. Y yes, yes, because, you know, in that sense, where I must say, Eyal mentioned a lot about the, I'm very interested in this notion, in the forensics, but of the kind of war torn, the kind of destruction, the carcass, the, the ruin, I'm interested in the forensics of the kind of picturesque in the fact that what produced the collisions that are disguised as, as 
as you know uh, environments that are easy, you know that that really um, let's say in my case in Southern California, what produces the kind of stupidity ultimately of sprawl and it's and it's equally uh, um, destructive kind of dimension, if I can mention that. In other words, retroactively, how do we expose the institutional uh, uh, kind of uh, control and kind of dominance of those, you know, of, that, that produces such collisions. And so, so in other words, what processes of visualization would enable equally a forensics of the institutions to expose, in fact, dynamics that have ultimately produced the crisis without the crisis being yet physical? And so, yes, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking that all of us are in these conditions. What other tools and processes <coughs> need to be enacted uh, to enter into that discussion? So in, in the contexts in which you individually operate, I'm wondering how do you actually introduce yourself in terms of your role? Because I'm sure that a lot of us, uh, uh, if they would, for example, read about the projects that you've described, they wouldn't necessarily think of those as kind of conventional architectural projects. And therefore, also the role of the architect is somewhat, at least kind of conventionally understood, different. So I'm wondering when you're in these kind of projects or when you're starting to talk to people, when projects are kind of uh, emerging, how do you actually start talking to them or how do you explain your role? In the fifth, uh, is that is Tom? Yeah. Yes. In the fifth project, uh, one of our legitimation, it was to be architect and resident too. So this, is, this was really very important. But after this the, uh, fifth project, for us, uh, it, uh, this experience, it was like a business card. And uh, it was a very useful one because, uh, by example, actually you work uh, in uh, banlieue in uh, suburbia around Paris, where there are very s difficult social context, and some of local people they are against architects. They tell us, "But you are architect, so you want to win a lot of money and to build concrete, etc." And uh, and because you have this business card from this uh, first experience in which you are involved with like architects, but like residents too, and because they know in our economy you are uh, in the same time a professional, uh, in a professional economy with a paid time, but in the same time in a uh, militant and citizen activity, so you work a lot for free too with our collaborators, and they know that. So it's a way to create trust and to create another position in front of architect and architecture. I also think that, <coughs> uh, in fact, we have shifted the roles along the project and along the process. Uh, we started, we initiated the, the process on with this double, double position, maybe triple position, because we were educators working with students. Yes. And bringing the students in the neighborhood was very important also for the students uh, because many of them are now, uh, I think, uh, trying to uh, start their own practices which, which are questioning somehow the conventional practice. So from this uh, condition of initiators, which we have shifted in the one of um, uh, assistance yeah. of... Uh, uh, of the emergence of this process of uh, self-managing. So we co-managed for a while the project with the inhabitants and then we have passed it on. So they started to co-manage it. And then we retired. We, uh, we stepped out of the project and, and completely leave it to them. And yeah. now we are just counselors. Yeah. So we are helping them with uh, information, with uh, professional advice when they need. So these uh, processes of negotiation in, in your projects, uh, Eyal and Teddy, they must be very complex because you're talking about cross-border, or you're, you're dealing with territories, which are basically cross-border territories. And you're dealing with realities on either side, I guess. So, so how how does that pan out in terms of your communication? Well, it's an interesting thing because it's ultimately an, an, an aspect of scale. I mean, I'm thinking of, on one hand, the scale of Ayat's work at that broader scale, not only of the territory, but of issues of sovereignty, issues of transnational kind of negotiation, so on, conflict, not resolution, but necessarily really dealing with that scale. In my case. It really is grounded on very small scales, and I wanted to mention this because I don't want to suggest that many of us who talk about participation in small-scale development are only dealing with smallness as a device. 
how to open up a possibility in my case that by rethinking a neighborhood and allowing it or enable it to be the developer of its own housing logics, we can begin to reimagine the region. We can begin to reimagine those, that larger scale. And in so doing and thinking of the instruments that you're talking about, one of particular instrument in our case of visualization, while models are essential as devices, has been the actual protocols of development. So for example, a developer's spreadsheet where profit is manipulated, where lending is distributed, when you know all of those logics that are so specialized within the context of the economies of development now are appropriated by the, the community. And in so doing, that becomes a device to reconstruct itself. Imagine that, a developer's pro forma as, an art, as a device to construct community. So in that sense, it's the small that trickles up, pushing in a counter type of direction to redefine logics from the top down. So I'm thinking, I'm thinking of the small, but just as a device to really rethink political structures and economic models from the top down. And I think that equally, you could argue that the broad scale of AI might begin to trickle down to redefine. So this sort of transference of scalar type of trans uh, is, is a very important issue. I would say, um, also to add to Teddy's point, and uh, somehow following the kind of introduction that we did to your book, that we need also to see, you know, I, I, I love activism, no? I mean, I do it, I engage with it, but we need to understand that at some point activism could also be the problem in situations. And, um, and that the horizon of participation is collaboration, no? And we know what that means, no? What the reference to that. Collaborators with dictatorial dictatorial or fascist regimes have always engaged under the kind of either pretext or sincere intention of alleviating the pain or the crime that is being perpetuated or perpetrated uh, in front of them. And uh, in the model of participation that I showed, I showed how human rights activists and lawyers are being brought into a process that not only legitimizes it, gives it form. Right? The contemporary colonialism is one, or the postmodern colonialism is one in which the victims, the humanitarian, the human right agents are part of the mechanism of its enactment. So I think that this by no means should say you should never engage and always retreat from a situation, but it means that every form of your engagement needs to be measured against that possibility, the possibility of collaboration. The possibility that, you know, that in fact you enable uh, <coughs> capitalist development or you enable dispossession or you enable incarceration uh, or, you know, the, the very process you think that you are against, no? So I think that that kind of, you need to draw the limit concepts and you need to go to the most horrific of examples to do it, even if they seemingly do not relate to your work, in order to constantly check yourself. Constant do self-critique, auto-critique as a mechanism of political engagement. And, you, and auto-critique is obviously the most brutal of all <laughs> forms of critique, no? I think it's also yeah. very interesting because you're mentioning this kind of process, process of, let's say, constant revision. And what I find really interesting about all your work is that there seems to be this uh, kind of trajectory throughout, you know, many years where it almost feels like what you're doing is kind of an ongoing project, regardless of uh, where a particular project is located. So do you think that's true to say? Or? Yeah, but uh, <coughs> I, I would just want to add something, maybe a parenthesis or maybe some uh, quotation mark, because I think, nevertheless, uh, you can't escape to be caught in, in this process. So for us, it was important to to still um, be active, <laughs> I would say, to still <coughs> experiment, to still do something that can be criticized, that can be um, <coughs> appropriated by, uh, by the politics, but, uh, but at the same time it creates uh, a context, it creates a precedent, it creates something that others can learn from, can take further, and I think it needs certainly this 
constant awareness, at constant discussion, yeah, and, and constant uh, self-criticism also. Yeah. But uh, I think this shouldn't be um, uh, an incentive to stop <laughs> doing it. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I have uh, one last question, which actually comes back to this notion of the role of the architect. And I'm wondering, since, uh, you know, conventionally speaking, all of your roles are not very conventional. So I'm wondering when you start projects or when you're getting into projects and when you're meeting people within your projects, how do you actually get them to acknowledge your role? Since it's not something that's defined on paper or where there's an association that stands behind it because you've kind of defined your role yourself, right? Yeah. Um, let's say on the most uh, almost pretentious of levels, no? I mean, I think that there is an attempt, at least to, through this combination of uh, law, international law and architecture, to draw the contour of a new form of practice, mm -hmm. right? Or forensic architecture as a kind of sub-discipline or form of uh, engagement which constructs form and speaks to objects, no? Uh, in that respect. So I think, yeah, I mean, in a sense, you are making uh, out of shards of, you know, existing practices, you try to define new forms of engaging architecture. Primarily at a time in coming again from the United States, an epicenter of selfishness in terms of really the exacerbation of what really has become the crisis at this moment in terms of this sort of highly individualistic and sort of detached society in the way of constructing a political will, let's say, to embrace the collective. At this moment, it's an urgent situation, I think, to frame a new relationship between public policy and the collective's imagination. I'm interested, at least within my own milieu in the, in the United States, to really contribute to modalities or procedures that can elevate the possibility of a civic imagination. And in that sense, I think, immediately, one takes the role somehow of facilitating other types of conversations. So I think that I'm interested in this notion of the curator, the urban curator that facilitates processes, and in so doing contacts the different domains that have remained peripheral even up to now to architecture, namely economics, politics, and of course the kind of social relations that need to be reconfigured. And so I think in that sense, we're in constant sort of, you know, like a surfer, right? Like trying to really constantly modulate and, and, and construct the, the political itself as we, as we, as we uh, engage uh, in our work. So it's, it's nothing that can be categorized e e easily. All I'm saying is what is urgent at this moment is to expand our idea of practice, primarily within the context of architecture. Absolutely. Um, yes. In our case, um, what you try, uh, I believe your question is a very good one, but uh, maybe it must be completed about the role of people in our project. It's not just about the role of architects in our case. And what, uh, you are in front of a multiple crises now, economical, uh, ecological, resource, etc. And there are a lot of very serious analyses and studies and uh, with a very strong affirmation, uh, the concerned people, they are not able to do nothing. All the decision in this global crisis, they, they could be decided just in a global scale, like in Copenhagen last year between North and South countries, between China and States, etc. And they are not able to decide because there are a lot of differences and contradictions. So how to do local opportunity for, for people to act and it's what you try to do. So our role like architect is to find solution, to find opportunities and places and or time occasion for people to do something in order to act against that. And it's what, uh, in our case, it's, uh, it's uh, what you define like uh, collaborative participation or co-participation because you are completely inside in the project and it's a way to create trust. It's not uh, architecture for other ones. We are completely in the same situation with uh, the people. Absolutely. Thank you okay. very much. Uh, unfortunately, we have to stop here to give enough time to the other panels, but uh, thank you very much for being thank here. Thank you. Thanks for listening. Thank you.